if we're playing this out properly, Jones has to fight Tomas Brock. That's how that has to play out in the heavyweight division. But John Jones, Alex Pereira. Nobody's ever become a three-weight world champion. Oh, what a f the opportunity is now, right, I can become a three-weight world champion. I can do something that nobody else has ever done. And in order to do it, I'm going to have to beat the greatest of all time to do it. Wow. Let's go, boys. Indeed. Let's go. Welcome to Uncaged on the TalkSport MMA YouTube channel. I'm Adam Catterall, pleasure as always to be in your company. And this man is hot-footed it from his last destination to his new destination in the final elements of his camp as we hurtle towards November and the final of the PFL featherweight tournament. The one, the only, Mr. Brendan Lockney. How are you, mate? Jet-lagged or not? Has it been all right for you? I am a bit jet-lagged, I'll be honest, Adam, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got there. Wait, let me just tell you this. How did this work out now? So I landed... And I thought, yeah, sweet. That was a pretty smooth flight. Um, landed at 8 p.m. Now I'm being tough. It's about 11. Then I woke up at 3. And you know what it's like, mate? When you wake up at 3 and jet lagging, you just stare at the ceiling like, oh, it's one of them ones, isn't it? So I was in the gym at 7. I don't get up at 7 ever, mate. It doesn't exist for me. So going in the gym at 7 was a new experience. And, uh, yeah, now I'm on the time zone one day. Professional! There you go. You've done, you've, done, you've done the bit in the Middle East and now you're out in uh, Thailand. Uh, yep. Finishing off the camp, getting ready for uh, getting ready for the final in November. Who's on the mats? Who's in there? Come on, give us some names. Give us some goss. Who's in, in there doing doing some bits? The only name I care about is Peter Yanlans on one day. Listen, when me and him are together training, yeah, different. Honestly, we're racing each other up the border and everything. It's it's great. Honestly, he's a little workhorse like myself. So, and he's fighting for grade already. So we have both got grapplers, so it's perfect. What a fantastic fight that is for him. Honestly, yeah. I can imagine that the spars between you two is like watching something on fast forward. Do you know, like when you skip oh. into the next bit of the TV show and everything's just really rapid, I can only imagine that's what it looks like, mate. It's incredible, mate. Honestly, he's such a great guy to be around. I've trained with him for years now. And when he's one of the trainers said, oh, you know, Peter's coming on Monday. And I messaged him. He's like, yeah, yeah. I was like, yes. Because really, when you get here, mate, it's so big, the gym. And it's always, always people in camp. So you're always getting work. But you're thinking, where's the big boys at? Like, when are they in camp? When have they got fights? And Peter's the week before me, and So perfect. Look at that. Iron sharpening iron. Locked in exactly. and together. There's the, there's the next double act in MMA. Exactly. We need to get him on the show. Do you know what it is? Let me tell you what's funny about Peter. You go there, right? And he's got his, this old Russian coach called Karat, yeah? And they put on this Balls Day Speak up. And all it is is old school Russian. It's got us all doing jab kick, jab kick, jab kick. Proper training like the movie. I love it. It's great. <laughs> oh, back in the old Soviet days. That's where Soviet. we're at. That's what they're on. Full, full on. Right. Listen, they're get him on the show. I know, I, I, I know that his uh, English is limited, but he's got a wicked sense of humour when he does use it. So let's yeah, try yeah. and get him on. Let's try and get him on the show at some point because he is a funny. He is a funny little fella. He's actually got banned, mate. Like the other day, I said to him, "Wow, your English is getting well better." And he's like, "Bro, I take lessons, bro. So he's calling me bro now and everything." <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Coming soon to an uncaged show near you, Piotr Jans, yeah. in, in yeah. England. We'll just teach him a lot of swear words, mate. We'll have a laugh with yeah, you. Exactly, yeah, exactly. So, so it done. Um, were you in transit then for UFC 307? Did you manage to catch it? How did, how did it all work for you over the weekend? Highlights. I've seen the highlights. I've seen enough. I've heard enough. And it's, uh, wow, it's exactly what we thought it was going to be. A spectacle, wasn't it? That main, that main event absolutely was. And our, listen, our production team get a little bit giddy on this show, don't they? They write us a few notes before the show and they say, right, I want this discussion. Is he the greatest of all time? Is he the pound for pound number one? Is he the best Brazilian fighter ever? Just chill, chill your jets. So no, nobody is denying that we are living through a period of greatness with Alex yep. Pereira. We genuinely are. Three defences in that period of time. He's absolutely sensational taking Ronda Rousey's record. He's only been in the UFC for just shy of three years. He's had 10 fights. He's 9-1. and one. He's beaten champion after champion after champion. Yes. And this legacy is going to continue because he's probably going to go up to heavyweight and he might make a dent there as well and become a three-weight world champion, which would be unprecedented. Nobody's done that before. And then maybe we start those conversations about greatest of all time and all that. Right now... He is the poster boy of the UFC. I don't care what anybody says. That's that's one thing that we can absolutely tick off. Whenever there's a problem, you send up the signal. Pereira says yes. He turns up and he delivers, mate. And in this fight, I love this fight. The reason for it is because he doesn't have it all his own way. Khalil turned yeah. up as well. 
He asked him some questions. He said, "Here, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? He figures it out. He goes through the gears. His range control, mate. I mean, you as a striker, you must be sat there going, dude, mate, this range control from this fella, the way, where he places his feet on the mat is just something else. And he doesn't waste the shot. He is a vicious, vicious man. Well, you know, taking um, out of the picture the Israel fight, you know, it's definitely the, the most trouble we've seen him on the feet in it. Like how how much been... has that win for Israel aged like a fine wine now with what he did to Alex Pereira? Unbelievable. This is what I mean, I'm people, saying. People will blame weight cut and being drained at middle. No, hang on a minute. Pereira beat him. And he went into the fire and he fired when Pereira was firing. That takes a lot of nuts to be able to do that. That's a sensational win from Izzy. The timing was absolutely incredible. And I actually watched some training footage of him practicing him coming on to him and doing that. So you can't say any of these things are a fluke. They're really not. Um, but Khalil asked massive questions of him. Oh, oh, a great striker himself, a polished Thai fighter out here. It's really adopted the Thai style that we're talking about. Actually dropped Pereira and asked him a lot of questions. Um, personally, I'd love to see him move up now because I do not want to see him fight Ankalaya. I don't, mate. I, I just what? want him to move what? up. I just want him to move up. You know why? You know why? Because I don't want to watch my hero get wrestled to death. That's right. So I want to see him move up and fight Tom or John. That's just me. I think listen, the, the good thing in the aftermath, right? The, these are the positives of the, of the aftermath with Alex Pereira. And we'll talk Khalil in a minute. Alex Pereira gets on the microphone. He said, listen, there was chat about me going down in weight. I'm not going to do that because I'm now mates with Sean Strickland. So I'm not going to get in his way. So Sean's going to crack on. And we've been told over the last 24 hours that Sean Strickland and Drickus Duplessis is the next title fight at middleweight. Great. Even though we've got this title contender fight between Robert Whittaker and Hamza coming up. Hopefully that bottleneck gets sorted out at middleweight. So Alex then says, there's still business to take care of at light heavy. I'm open to a conversation about heavy as well. I agree with what you're saying. Because now, right, as we stand here right now, he's he's come out and he said, Listen, I've had a few niggles in camp. I'm gonna take a break. When the signal goes up, if you're in trouble from now till the end of the year, don't call me because I'm I'm having a rest, which is a good thing. Fair enough. I think I think all eyes now, mate, are on that fight in Abu Dhabi between Magomed Ankalaev and Alexander Rakic. They have to make a statement. It isn't just about winning that fight. They have to do something that captures the imagination of the fight fan, that gets us on the edge of the seat, that makes us demand the fight with Alex Pereira. If they don't do that, then I agree with what you've just said. Because we've got a fight in November between John and Stipe. Legends fight. Call it whatever you want, Will it's highly likely that they're going to ride off into the sunset. And if they do ride off into the sunset, Tom Aspinall is going to be upgraded to the undisputed champion, or they're going to make an undisputed champion fight between Tom Aspinall and someone else. That someone else, for me, has to be Alex Pereira. Well, listen, you just mapped it out perfect. There he goes again, the UFC matchmaker, Adam Cattrall, ladies and gentlemen. Look, see how you come up with these avenues. Listen... <laughs> You just, honestly, you're brilliant. Like, you but that, just come but up that's with the some... narrative. But you, no, you know it's... this game. You know the game. In 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 October, Anklaev can't just win. He has to demolish Rakic, get on the microphone and cause murder in order to get himself the Pereira fight, doesn't he? I still don't think he gets it if that heavyweight's available. If John does retire after the win that I think he's going to get, he's still not going to get it, mate, because everyone in the world, and it's a much bigger fight with Tom Aspinall, do you agree? Yes, I do. I think it's absolutely right. gigantic. I, th I personally think it could be in 2020. Listen, we're going to talk about Amanda Nunes maybe coming back. And, and Nunes, yeah. Kayla Harrison is a gigantic fight for me in 2025. But it absolutely gets oh. morphed if Alex oh. Pereira goes up to heavyweight and fights Tom Aspinall. And it's so great for that. Tom's legacy. Tom needs a fight oh. like that as well. Tom of needs course. that fight, man. Because he's, he's the guy. Alex is the guy right now. Um, Tom's making all the right moves and... You know, he's even getting better on the mic now. He, you know, he's got his funny things going, even in the back of because he hands the petrol at the back of you. He's got his own thing going. This story, it needs to happen. It needs to happen exactly the way you just said it. Now, let's just put a little bump in that, right? Let's say, I mean, a lot of people, obviously, when they talk about the Jones and Stipe fight, are automatically saying that Jones is going to win. Listen, we're talking about Stipe Miocic. I know he's been out for a long period of time. He's been there, done it and got the T-shirt. He can crack. And he can do a bit. So you never know. He might be able to pull this off. But let's go with a, with a normal narrative yeah. that Jones is going to win. Yeah. So let's say Jones wins and Jones sticks around. Right? 
he, for me, if we're if we're if we're playing this out properly, he has to fight Tom Aspinall, right? Jones has to fight Tom Aspinall. That's how that has to play out in the heavyweight division. But let's take our friendships aside and just stand at the side for one second and analyze which is the bigger fight: John Jones, Tom Aspinall, John Jones, Alex Pereira. Which is the bigger fight? I personally do think that John is going to retire, Adam. But let's say he doesn't, yeah? yeah? We know what the bigger fight is. Do you know what I mean? We know, we know John Jones will always carry the name of the greatest of all time and you've got this Brazilian guy who's mopping everyone up. And let's say he goes and one bombs Miotic out of there because let's be honest, I was watching him move on some latest training videos. He still looks like he's moving, mate. Like, sharply. Oh, John. Yeah, I saw that as yes. well. I think he was doing some stuff yes. with James Stevenson, wasn't he? The wrestler. He, he See looked... that reactive knee? Like, he's still on it, mate. Yeah. So, we might still get the best version of John. Who knows what's going to happen in this fight? And then if we do, Pereira's banging everyone out. Maybe John will get on the mic and say, because let's have it right. That's a good fight for John. Who can mix it up at any point? Oh. Who can mix it up? Stylistically, it's great for John. It's fantastic for John. And also this is what it does too, right? It quashes... I know, listen, like I keep saying, it should be John and Tom. That's the fight, right? But when will we ever get the opportunity to have a potential GOAT fight? Now, hear me out on this. John Jones is the GOAT, right? He's the GOAT. He's, yeah. the, the, body, the body of work has led him to this point. Yeah, 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 most yeah, people yeah. now will conclude that he's the greatest of all time being a two-time yeah. world champion as well. Nobody's ever become a three-weight world champion. So, if Alex Pereira oh, well, yeah. step, steps up to heavyweight, the opportunity is now, right, I can become a three-weight world champion. I can do something that nobody else has ever done. And in order to do it, I'm going to have to beat the greatest of all time to do it. What? So, therefore, now, off the back of that, a conversation then arises where, hang on a minute, is Alex Pereira the greatest of all time? If he pulls it off. So when are you ever going to get the opportunity of a, right, okay, we're going to distinguish the GOAT in MMA. Here we go. I mean, look, there he goes again. There's another one for Adam Cantu. <laughs> nah, that, one, that was a home run. That was a home run, that one, because really, wow, you just made me think. I think that is the fight. Let's just hope all the – I bet the UFC are praying for this to align because this is like legendary stuff, like you said. John Jones – was, you know, listen, it's hard to tell off a 30-second clip, but from what I've seen as a martial artist, yeah, he, looked good. he, looked good, he looks like. loose, he looks in great shape from the picture that I've seen, he looks reactive, he looks sharp, he looks great. So that fight is going ahead. If that goes the way we think it's going to go, Pereira's not the type to back down from a goal fight, is it? So, wow. Wow. Let's go, boys. Indeed. Let's go. Just a little word on uh, Khalil Roundtree. I know he's lost the fight, and obviously this is his title fight, and you expect people to, to roll the dice. But not everybody does, mate. Not everybody does roll the dice. And I want to just tip my cap to Khalil Roundtree, because when he got the opportunity, a lot of people maybe raised their eyebrows and thought to themselves, it should be Magomed Ankalaev. Why is Khalil Roundtree getting this shot? Well, he got his shot, and he had a go. He asked, question, he asked proper questions of Alex Pereira, and Jesus, man, it took something very special to get him out of there because that man has a massive, massive set of stones. And it kind of just epitomized why I love MMA. You get a, you get an opportunity, don't waste it. Go out on your shield, go for it. Absolutely roll every, Even if you lose, just go for it. And Khalil Roundtree absolutely did that. No, he did. And, you know, this was his big moment and he grabbed it by the scruff of the neck. Um, he asked massive questions. He even dropped Pereira. Um, and we all know the real reason he got that fight is to make a fight like we see. Yeah, it was going to be on the feet. It was going to be back and forth. They were going to have it. Uh, eventually, someone was going to come on top. That was Pereira. Um, I mean, God, I see his uh, I see his face on Instagram this morning. I'm like, oh my God, why do I do this? I literally thought to myself, why do I do this? Look at the state of his face, mate. That is like that is some damage. Um, but again. He put it all on the line. Massive respect to the man. And listen, nobody lost in that fight. He gained a lot from that fight, Khalil Roundtree. Yeah, he absolutely did. And hopefully he'll get looked after and get another uh, opportunity in the not-too-distant future. Um, now, 
Seeing as that we've had Mark Goddard on the show recently, mate, I'm going to have some serious moans about scoring. You know how I roll on here. Um, Let's go. First up, we had the co-main event. Uh, Juliana Pena reclaims her belt against Raquel Pennington. I think we actually both predicted that that would happen. We did. But having watched the fight, I don't believe it should have happened. Um, because we, we end up with a, a split decision victory in Juliana Pena's favour. And I think it all comes down to the first round. I think rounds two and three are very simple to score. Juliana Pena. Round number four is absolutely simple to score because Rocky Pennington puts it on her. That's hers as well. And I think five's tight, but I still think it's a, a Pennington round. So you've got two, two, you've got two, two there. What is, where does round number one go? And I just don't think there's enough data for us to be swaying it in the, in the favour of uh, Juliana Pena. I think that Raquel Pennington landed more of the telling shots in that particular round, even though there's not a lot of them. And therefore she, uh, she should have had her hand raised. I feel for her because when you lose a title like that, when it is so razor close, you kind of want to make noise for a rematch that they've got to go again, but let's be dead straight. One, it's not an attractive fight for people to get excited about. <laughs> and two, Kayla Harrison's here and she's next in line and we want her in a world title fight. And that's got to be the fight that Juliana Pena has next. I mean, let's just call it what it is. We need Amanda Nunes back in this division ASAP, yeah, we don't do. we? Because it needs fighting up again. Um, Kayla, you know, big fan of Kayla, but she wasn't electrifying either. You know what I mean? Like, no. I really thought she was... You know what I'm saying? Like, let's be honest. Yeah. I was raving about her last week. Um, and, yeah, it needs Amanda Nunes injected straight back in there. It really does. That that division really needs spice up. It seems like a lot of back and forth. We thought Kayla was going to be the one to come in and stir it all up, which she did on the debut. But then, you know, it's kind of stalemate in the second fight and we... Again, we just need Amanda Nunes back in there. And she's making videos now. Call me Dana. Call me Dana. Dana, call her. We need her. Don't we, Adam? Absolutely. Listen, the beautiful thing about this is that you've got a narrative with two girls here now. Juliana Pena yeah. is one on one with Nunes, right? Yeah. Even though the first one, I think, listen, Nunes has just taken her eye off the ball. She rectified it in the second. Agreed. Round. So Juliana Pena is one on one with Nunes. Keller Harrison's got. Former training partner of Nunes, bit of narrative there and what have you. Yeah. Sim simple. Nunes is coming back in 2025. It's obvious, man. Look at her. She's in great shape. She's saying, call me Dana. She wants to rock and roll. Make Pena versus Harrison. They'll absolutely chirp away at each other. They'll capture everybody's imagination at the press conferences. Do it at the start of next year. And then International Fight Week next year, the winner of that then has a story to sell with Amanda Nunes' comeback. You've either got a trilogy fight with Juliana Pena Brilliant. Or you've got, right, Kayla Harrison's here. She's the champ now. But is she really the champ? Because the real, real champ is coming mm. back out of retirement. That's how you do it, I think. Maybe that's exactly the way I would do it. And I think uh, the sport has missed Amanda Nunes. The women's division has missed Amanda Nunes massively. She's excited. Remember when she burst onto the scene and was just knocking everyone out? Oh, like you say, the, it was incredible to watch, especially the Ronda Rousey. It was just like, she was just... She's just a step above. Um, and I really think this with this Pena having this win over her, as we all know, you know, it was one of them ones. Uh, but she still has it, still creates a story. Get her and Kayla in the cage. And then, um, like you say, Amanda comes out of retirement. And on that video, I'll be honest, she looks in better shape than when she was fighting. She looks Mate. incredible. So I'm looking forward to it. Mate, I, I completely agree. She looks happy. She looks she did. full. She looks ready. She did. Roll, man. She, she looked great. Now, should Jose Aldo have had his arm raised? I think so, because I love him. But he's like the greatest <laughs> man you ever. can't do that. Yeah, I, I love him, so he's winning. End of. It's not nice when he loses, is it? Let's have it right, Adam. No, and in the manner of which this... I know, happened, mate, I know. I think the first round, I was impressed, actually, with Mario Bautista. He come out and he looked like he wanted to have a fight with him. Great stuff, mate. And I actually gave Mario Bautista the first round. I thought he just about nicked it. Aldo makes a few adjustments. The leg kicks weren't there, which was surprising, but he made a few adjustments. He comes through, and I think he nicks round number two. I actually think round number two is a close round, but I think he nicks it. So we're 1-1 one, one going into the last round. Now, you end up having 90 seconds to two minutes of very nip and tuck, close striking, nothing really significant. And then Batista decides to, well, I'm just going to hug him against the cage now. I'm going to control him. For I'm going to try and control him for three minutes. 
Now, listen, let's stem back to our conversation with Mr. Mark Goddard a couple of weeks ago. We're looking mm-hmm. for damage, man. We're looking for effective striking. We're looking for effective grappling. That's the key word, effective. Was the grappling up against the cage, just holding, stalling, effective enough to score points on the judges' scorecards to give Mario Bautista that round? My opinion is absolutely not. He was non-fighting, and that is not re- that shouldn't be rewarded. Just like you don't reward Jose Aldo's takedown defence, who, by the way, against Bautista, last time out against Martinez, and Mirab, Mirab. Yeah, right? zero. He is, he's zero for 28 t- takedown attempts, mate. The takedown defence is sensational. Now, okay, you don't reward it because it's his job to defend, but in effect, he's won, won the grappling exchanges by stopping what the other guy wants to do. That's an argument for another day, all right? I just think that Mario Bautista non-fighting shouldn't, and, and what people would class as control, should not be rewarded. What you need to look at is when Mike Beltran then says, separate, and he breaks them up, what happens? Jose Aldo leathers him, and then, he, and then they grapple again, and then we go back up against the cage, and then we have another separation, and Jose Aldo leathers him again. We only have two or three strikes. If you look at the significant strike differential in that last round, Aldo outlands Bautista by seven strikes. And that, for me, is enough to say that Jose Aldo should have won that fight. The judges got it wrong, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, we actually know now, don't we? We're not taking educated guesses anymore after our lesson the other day. So we know what we're looking at, aren't we? So, I mean, that leaning on people on the fence and all that. Listen, in my in my eyes, it's stalling. It's what they call stalling. And then in Pride back in the day, you'd get a yellow card for that. Like, they had yellow cards for Mate, things like that. you got old school. I love it. As, like, they, you'd get took off and go, stop stalling. And it's like, that's exactly what he was doing. He's thinking, right, how long's left here? Five minutes. All right, I'm going to try and hold and do absolutely nothing. You're not fighting. So you're not trying to win. You should only score when you are trying to win. Like, that should be the differential in the scoring, and he wasn't doing that. I completely agree. Um, listen, I'm a massive fan of Jose Aldo as well. We need to see him again. Let's get him away from altitude. So, even though I think he wins the fight anyway, move away from the altitude. Let's come down to sea level and let's just fight in Rio, mate. Let's just have a party. Who next? Is Dom Cruz still about? Uh, uh, that has to be that now, doesn't it? A bit of a legends one. I heard that was happening down the, down the yeah. pipeline they somewhere. Talking, they were talking about it a long time. Um, listen, if Dom's fit, ready to rock and roll. Dom Cruz, Jose Aldo, come on. That's the one. That's the one. That's the one. Just for people like us that have been in it from the beginning, isn't it? Just, just mate, that's a proper legends fight. It let's is. Have a proper, let's it have is. a proper legends fight. Um, what did you make of Kevin Holland's, the ending to the fight with Roman De Lidze at the end of the first round? Strange, but I'm happy because I picked Roman De Lidze anyway, so that means I won up on you. So, I'll take it. I'll take uh, it. I'll <laughs> Listen, I'm I'm all for corner compassion. I'm all for yeah. that, especially, you know, we don't see enough of it in MMA. We just keep throwing people into these lion, lion's dens and fighters are always going to fight, want to fight and what have you. Um, so I'm kind of happy that that conversation w- went on and there was a proper conversation about, listen, it's not a title fight. We can live to fight another day. If you're injured, I'm not sending you out there because this ge- geezer is an absolute animal. It is what it is. I just don't know mm-hmm. what a victory like that type of victory does for Roman de Lidze going forward. Do we run the fight back or do we just get him something in and around that same ranking system? I mean, it gets him two paychecks. Uh, I mean, that's yeah, that's a big enough. one. Like, like It does, like, at the end of the day, let's say you, for example, on 150, 150, gets you another 150, mate. And um, when you're at that level, you're like, I'll take that. So a win's a win. Um, run it back. Yeah, potentially. Um, but there's there's loads of fights for both of them in that division. Uh, Joaquin Buckley broke my heart, mate, because uh, I've been watched that first round. I thought, Wonder Boy's doing Wonder Boy, man. Yeah, he's 41 years of age, but look at that nice wide karate stance. He's bouncing on his toes. His points scoring beautifully. Uh, he's, looking, he's looking great. And then, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm biased with my scoring because I think that Stephen does enough in round number two to take that. So maybe he's two up. Others had it 1-1, one, one, so I've got to concede that. But even so, whatever whatever that score is going into the third round, Joaquin Buckley took the decision, I am not leaving this to the judges. I need this win. I am not leaving this to the judges. I'm going after him. And the way that he shifts his feet in order to land that bomb, 
mate, you've got to take your hat off because that is absolutely fantastic striking. And he deserved it. If you chase it, if you chase down a legend like that and you land on him and you knock him out, only the second person to ever do that inside the UFC, you deserve all the credit in the world. Well done, Joaquin. 100 percent You see what Connor said? Stand your base. Stand your base. And you know what? He's right. It, it, you know, I love the style, but it is too back off the other. It's too back off it. Um, mm. If Stephen did stand his base a few times, he could have really hurt Joaquin. You know what I mean? But he yeah. does. He's always on the back foot. And he's lost a lot of split decisions because of that back foot style. I, I, um, yeah. So, you know, you know, you know, although Connor was having a laugh with what he said, I believe in some of the stuff that he said because I think that he could have beat Joaquin by standing his base and, and standing his ground a bit more, but take nothing away from Joaquin with an amazing shot. And yeah, it's just sad watching Stephen go out. It is. Yeah. Uh, listen, all in all, a decent night, UFC 307. Um, obviously, the cherry on top of the cake is the main event. Uh, Alex Pereira doing the business and uh, getting everybody chatting. There's a couple of fights in there that meander. There's some weird judging calls, some weird refereeing in the Pachera fight. You've got eye pokes galore that don't get called. And then the minute he starts to do a little bit of wrestling, Nah, separated after 15 seconds. He can't get any of his work off. It was just a weird bit of refereeing in that particular fight. Um, and obviously, we tip the cap to Carla Esparza, who calls time on her career. Two-time champ. It felt like it felt like a retirement fight from her point of view. Like she hadn't really dialed in on the magnitude. She turned up basically to wave goodbye to everybody. And, then, and she ended up getting beat first time she's uh, suffered a unanimous points decision. Uh, victory in her time in the UFC. But all in all, uh, a solid, solid career. Um, we've spoke about potential fights going forward for everything that happened at UFC uh, 307. What did you make of this? Last 24 hours, I, I always tune in on a Tuesday morning to, uh, uh, sorry, on a Wednesday morning, Tuesday night this is in America, uh, to Dana White's Contender Series because it's the only time really that he gets in front of the media and starts answering questions. And someone posted uh, what uh, Dustin Poirier had thrown uh, out on social media about uh, a four-man round-robin tournament for the BMF. And the people that he named for this are Justin Gaethje, Max Holloway, and Dan Hooker. What would you make of it? Love it. I absolutely love it. Legends. Legends galore. And, um, yeah, Dustin would say that, though, would he? Because we all know how well Dustin's done with these fellas. So, uh, but but... Every one of them. I mean, the hook, we were talking about the Hooker and Poirier fight the other day, but we were talking about all them fights. Listen, put more of them into my veins. Let's go. Yeah. On what you've just said there, it is quite amusing that actually, because the only person to have beaten him out of them three is Justin Gaethje, and he's, what, and he's beating Gaethje. So he beat Gaethje in the first one. He's one and one with him. He's two and all with Max. Uh, and he's also, obviously, that fantastic fight that you said during the COVID pandemic with Dan Hooker. He's already beaten him in an absolute war. But listen, Matt, well, I think we're at that stage of the career now for Dustin Poirier where he's earned his stripes. He gets to call what he wants to call. And if he just wants to have a proper slobber knocker with somebody, then let's let's try and make that happen for him. Personally, I would love, love that trilogy fight with Justin Gaethje. That would be fantastic if, if we can make that happen. I know we've only just recently seen it for a BMF and Gaethje knocked him out, but I would love them to maybe make number three there. Can I just say how well that Max Holloway win has aged? Because, wow, wow. Like, to beat Max mm. Holloway the way he did, Adam, he beat him up. He beat Max you, Holloway up. Like We've got we've got to remember, Max did come up in weight for that. No, I know, and I know. It, but, and it, but and it still, was a replacement, wasn't it? But yeah, you're right. Plus, you're right. Max is like, like, like Max at the minute is, you know, especially if he goes out and does it against the Poria. You know what I mean? Like to beat him in the fashion that he did. It, it, you know, I remember watching that fight. I, was, I just thought Holloway, Holloway, Holloway all day. I'm a big Holloway fan. And the way Dustin walks him down and dealt with him. I mean, we're talking about weights, yeah. Max is huge. It's not like he had to come in underweight. And Poirier, Poirier was also a 55er once upon a time. Do you know what I mean? So um, it's just like, it is what it is with the weights, but the way he did that was incredible. Porry can do whatever he wants at this stage. He's given us so many moments over yeah. the years. And what a suggestion. I love it. I'm in. <laughs> just look. Anybody that suggests out, outlandish violence, you just go. Yeah. No, what? <laughs> I mean, them fights, every one of them when they fought was incredible. <laughs> it was incredible, wasn't it? 
Yeah, they were. Because the the first Gechi fight is... Re- I don't know if it's his debut, but it's really early in Gechi's career in the US. Yeah, he wow, comes over as the yeah. He comes over as the highlight reel, doesn't he? And then he just has a couple of bumps. He had Michael Johnson as well in there. And then he but, ran into Poirier. But they had a great back and forth and Poirier finishes him. And it's always back got- and forth. It's always back and forth, isn't it? It's never his way, is it? Yeah. It's always this with Poirier. And we love him for it. Listen, he suggested it. Dana seems in. Let's get it on. The four-man okay. tournament. And, that, and the resurgence of Dan Hooker as well. Uh, always good to uh, have his name thrown in there. Whilst we're talking Getchy, I don't know if you've uh, uh, you've seen, there was a question thrown at Dana last night. And I believe that this has come from uh, um, MMA manager Ali Abdelaziz. He didn't ask the question, but I think he said this on a podcast and one of the media members has thrown this towards Dana about uh, Connor turning down Justin Getchy many times. Now, listen, I'm not here to doubt anybody making claims about this, that and the other, but what I know of Conor McGregor, turning down, I don't think Conor McGregor turns down fights, does he? I mean, he's up for it. He, you know, he's fought everyone. Come on. Come on. And we... Yeah. Yeah, I can't see it, to be honest. But Ali's a character, isn't it? Listen, Ali, Ali is a character. Ali is he's fun to watch. We need The game needs Ali and Villazis. Like, the stuff that he comes out with, it's hilarious. What a character. But, but in es- what he's doing there, I mean, whether it's true or not... He's creating a narrative. Right? He's creating a story. He's exactly yeah. that, mate. So if Connor's going to fight again, he wants his guy to get some dough. Justin Gates is his guy. Listen, Connor, if you play into the ego, play to Connor's ego a little bit, and then Connor goes, I didn't turn nobody down. I'll tell you what, put him in the octagon. Let's get this thing on. Then Alia has done his job for his client. His client's getting weighed in, and he gets an opportunity against Connor. It's going to be interesting to see how this Connor story starts to play, isn't it? Because I've told you what I think the fight should be. Jorge Masvidal to get us to get us rocking rolling at the start of next year, and then who knows how it plays out um, with the remainder of the year, mate. But one thing that I do know is that some people might be against it. I'm all for it. Let's have Conor McGregor back in the UFC because it's a brighter place when he's here. No, we need it right now, especially with uh, you know Alex Pereira. He's he's getting older, mate, and he's coming towards the end now, isn't he? I mean, let's let's have it right and. You know, Sean O'Malley's just lost. You know, the guy that I actually said was the main guy in the UFC, Taporia, and everyone laughed at me. Like, like, he, he is. He, he goes and brushes Max. He is the biggest guy in the sport. I think he could be bigger than player if he really does Max. If he really does Max. Like, we're talking about a superstar here. The thing is, this is an interesting conversation. It is. About, 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 about Ilya Taporia. Because he is a sensational mixed martial artist, right? Sensational. Ridiculous. His boxing's outstanding. He's grappling. We haven't seen too much of it in the UFC, but his grappling's outstanding too. Um, he floats between 145 and 155. We all remember him going up and fighting Jai Herbert, who can crack. And Jai Herbert dropped him. But look what happened. He got up and he went, you cheeky so-and-so. Wow, yeah. I gave him an idea and nailed him and, and knocked out Jai Herbert. Now, okay, people might think, well, Jai's not at a championship level. Okay, granted. Yeah. Look what he did to Volk. We know Volk is. Look what he did there. If he does stop... St- I mean, listen, last time out, Max suffered his first ever knockdown. Knockdown! Not, not stoppage. Yeah. Knockdown. What? Now, I know, now, I know that um, we mentioned... Uh, Dustin and Max, didn't we? And, and Dustin subbed him, right? But nobody's knocked him out. If Ilya Taporia ends this ridiculous run that yeah. Max is on of fights where he's not suffered a stoppage defeat, we are then all of a sudden, we, I think we've got a new contender in the pound for pound conversation, mate. I genuinely believe that because of where Maybe. Max is at. And if you add the vault victory in there, he could be the star. And the beautiful the thing the thing is about it with Ilya Tapuria. Sorry, we've gone off on a tangent here, but Ilya Tapuria, he can do it inside the cage. That's the key, that's obviously the key thing. He's got that little bit of something different outside of the outside of the cage. He's like um, do you know like one of them bond baddies that's like a multi-millionaire bond baddie that doesn't really say too much, it's a little bit understated, wears the nice suits and all that type of carry. He's got that vibe about him, which I think. All right, it appeals to a certain demographic or a certain audience, but I, I genuinely think you can market that and make it 
wow, like proper crazy. Well, he's already doing that. Let's have it right. I mean, he's wearing the suits. He's at the burner bow. He's, he, he's, his style, like obviously I've got the same manager, so I'm a bit biased, but from what he tells me and what I've heard about him from on the inside, like he's, grass, he's grappling is better than he's striking. Yeah. Now that is a terrifying thought really, isn't it? When you're watching a guy who's got, let's have it right, pro boxing level hands, like yeah. world class body shots. The way he goes to the body and moves in and out of the pocket is phenomenal for MMA. Um, and then you, you put it along with the way he dresses, the way he talks, the way he carries himself. And then he knocks out Max Holloway. Yeah, I think we've got Sean O'Malley there and we've got Elia Taporia there, if, if he does it. It's a big if, but it's a great fight. And that's next month. We'll get to that next month. I'm not great <laughs> for that fight, mate. There you go. How many training sessions is it today, pal? How many have we got in? Well, I'm about to go and run up the body. I have to wait for sunset now. It's nearly sunset. So off I go, mate. Darkness. Real darkness. Up to the, on up my to own. the statue. On my own. Headphones in. With your thoughts. Let's go. The life of a fighter, ladies and gentlemen. There you go. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in to us. Make sure you like and subscribe the channel. Plenty of MMA chat coming your way. Next week, um, our team are going to be on the ground. For Francis Ngannou and Henan Ferreira, we'll be getting you as close to that action as possible. Obviously, Cyborg and Pacheco on there as well. And we've got Fabian Edwards taking on Johnny Eblin, which should be a cracker. This is all in the PFL, so we'll get you as close as we possibly can to that action. So like and subscribe to the channel so you never miss out. We'll catch you next time. On AM, on DAB, via the TalkSport app, and on your smart speaker. TalkSport.